Airing on Asheville FM 103.3 LPFM in Asheville, this is the Final Straw Radio. I remember reading an interview a decade ago where a taxi driver in Saudi Arabia was talking about Osama bin Laden. In response to a question, he said that it was the humiliation of the Arab world that one guy willing to tell the truth had to do it from a cave. My name is Sean Swain. I'm an anarchist held hostage at Ohio Supermax facility. I think about what that cab driver said as I sit here in my cell on the top floor, which might be a good measure of how dangerous they think I am. My cell looks a lot like, well, a cave. I think about the implications. Back in the old days, the United States was a free speech zone, or at least that was the happy narrative. Then came free speech zones, where you could remain silent where the people are, or else you could express yourself where there's no one to listen. Now consider Edward Snowden, Chelsea Manning, Eric Brown, Benito Five, the Cleveland Four, Jeremy Hammond, Daniel McGowan. Free speech zones are now exile and prison. If you think ideas the state doesn't like, they develop a way to criminalize your very existence. In my case, imprisonment wasn't enough. They had to send me to the highest security prison in the state for my ideology. And to be clear here, they aren't afraid of what I'm saying. They're afraid of you hearing what I'm saying. When the fascists control the neutralized speech, they're eliminating the sharing of ideas. If no one says it, then no one thinks it, and no one does it. So how free are you if you don't even know what you don't know? What idea is the NSA working hard to block you from encountering? What choices are foreclosed? To what degree are you programmed by default to a zombie life of shopping and drinking stones and decide someone else's pyramid? I don't know, and you don't either. The state spends 12 years telling you what to think in school, and then you get your news from Disney, named after a guy wanted by Hitler's Third Reich. McDonald's murders your food, American Idol murders your music, Walmart murders everything else, and the NSA murders your mind through attrition. To what extent do you feel like a concentration camp prisoner, biting your tongue about everything you see and you, everything you feel, marching day after day into the mass grave of our collective future, brought to you by corporate sponsors? Let me ask, how many times have you nodded while I've been talking? Would you say what I've said? Would you post it? Would you put your name to it? And if you did, would you go through the drudgery of your daily life just waiting for the day the authorities drag you away? See, you have material wealth I don't have. You have a bigger range of movement, more toys, tastier snacks, the potential for sex. You have more to lose. You have leverage to keep you silent. So now we're back to that cab driver who said it was the humiliation of the Arab world that the one guy willing to tell the truth had to do it from a cave. In your world, the guy telling the truth has to do it from a supermax facility. So my hope is that I'll say something that resonates with you out there listening for as long as we can go before the fascists pull the plug. And I'm going to talk without worrying about the authorities because, frankly, if I said this call is originating from an Ohio correctional institution and may be recorded or monitored. Because, frankly, if I said something wrong, my back should be dirty and my nose should be bleeding. But it's not, and it's not. So I'll keep talking. But there will likely come the day that you'll try to access my latest segment and you're going to hear five minutes of dead space. I won't be here. Someone will have decided that you can't listen to me anymore. Then, wherever I am and whatever's happening to me, I'll hope that you'll have the courage to reply with one word, no. Until then, I welcome questions and comments and feedback, and I hope we can create some system for you to communicate those to me. Thank you. This is Anarchist Prisoner Sean Swain from Ohio Supermax, and if you can hear the sound of my voice, you are the resistance. I was doing some looking in my calendars and I realized that the 10 year anniversary of your first segment, probably about swivelization and the hierarch dilemma or something, or about uh, people having sex with Doberman pinchers behind the um, Capitol building, was <laughs> recorded 10 years ago this January, which means that we've uh -huh. been having regular conversations for that long that's a long time for you to be getting on the radio that's a lot of like yeah. five to seven minute segments of of you discor discursing on topics yeah um discursing, so i kind of hope yeah thanks that's a five cent <laughs> word 
Um, I was hoping that we could uh, kind of go over some of the history of like, cause you've, it's, it's been a lot. There's been a lot over this. It's been a lot. There's been a lot that's happened over the last 10 years of you doing this segment uh-huh. that sometimes uh-huh. makes it into the segments and sometimes doesn't. Um, but I think for anyone yeah. who's like listening and maybe hasn't been aware of your work and your writing and your resistance, it'd be cool uh-huh. to have an opportunity to sort of recap some of it and, to be yeah. able to like think about it and yeah, I don't know, just like, you know, process through some of it. Mm-hmm. So if, if you're cool with that. Oh, absolutely. And 10 years, that's, that's kind of amazing. Yeah. It's really irresponsible of you. <laughs> yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you for the yeah, radio over, stations over that let me years. put this on the air. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, over 10 years, over 10 years, you, you, you haven't pulled the plug on me yet. I just can't imagine. Gotta need a hobby. I'm just a glutton for punishment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, cool. Yeah, so, I mean, just to just to get it rolling, the first time that I heard about you was probably from a post, because I wasn't doing a lot of direct communication with prisoners at this point, but there was a post about this police raid of a cell that occurred that was, like, posted on anarchistnews.org, which mm-hmm. awarded you an award at one point. Yeah. And uh, so I started talking to Ben Turk, who was a part of Redbird Abolition in Ohio at that point and had been corresponding with you and doing support work with you. Um, mm-hmm. And so I wonder if you could kind of like a link in the show notes for anyone who wants to go back and listen to that episode when you they can hear uh-huh. you're a much younger you and a much younger me and Ben Turk, who doesn't age and uh, Blackjack, yeah. uh, all of their voices <laughs> in there. But I wonder if you could just sort of like regale us with what was happening at that time and and sort of what that was all about where you were at all that jazz yeah so um yeah so oh wow at mansfield there was a thing called the army of the 12 monkeys and they wilded it out and um kind of tore the prison apart and so we didn't know it at the time but the, the uh prison officials were working with the Joint Terrorism Task Force of the FBI, and they came in and did ideological profiling. And um, I ended up in the hole with three other prisoners at one point. It was two at the beginning. And then um, they subjected us to a year of torture. It was terrible. And uh, based on my ideology, which, you know, they said that it was anarchists that tore their prison apart, and uh, I've read their material, and it seems to me that they were more like Maoists, but what do I know? And so they sent me off to the Super Duper Max, and that's when Ben, Ben is awesome, by the way, that's when Ben told me that there was a radio station that that, uh, that wanted to do an interview with me. <laughs> and I said, well, I mean, you know, taste aside, I guess, uh, yeah, I can do that. And, and, and that's yeah. how we ended up, uh, that's how we ended up talking for whatever reason you wanted to talk to a guy like me. Well, I think it, the personal ad that's at the beginning of, uh, well, I mean, the piece of writing was really good and in, you know, exciting about the experience of sabotaging the attempts of the crew, the cert team to like clear uh-huh. the room that you and I think blackjack were in at the time was, it was like entertaining oh, yeah. stuff, but also like Ben opened up with this, like, uh yeah people like your your piece of writing or something that said like uh some people wanted me to write a personal ad i don't know why but here we go i'm seeking a woman who has training on flying a helicopter like meet me in the courtyard (laughs) laying down suppressing fire whatever (laughs) yep yep uh A single white male seeking a long-term or short-term relationship with a uh, with a with a female helicopter pilot, any ethnicity must be willing to lay down grazing fire or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. For some reason, people didn't feel I was being genuine and sincere. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it wasn't until you started talking about uh, turkey basters that they really got serious about it. Yeah. So. <laughs> so all right, so so you you and the other two prisoners were accused of being co-conspirators in that case, where somehow apparently a bunch of the material was like 
large copious amounts of photocopied manuals of sabotage were entering prisoner cells. <laughs> I didn't have any of the materials in my possession. They searched my cell for like three hours, you know, and they came up with nothing. They came up with a JPEG article I had written, critical of JPEG. But they found all these materials everywhere else, you know. So what they had to do to link me to the Army of the Twelve Monkeys, because they wanted to make me the leader of it, was they had to say that essentially I thought like a monkey, and the monkeys thought like me, and therefore I was the one who, who did it all, even though there was absolutely nothing connecting me to them, including ideology, really, if it turns out they're Maoists, because I'm not a Maoist. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I mean, they did tear a prison apart, so they're not all bad. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, what we found out later when I got parts, pieces, and parts of my FBI file, I've got like 223 pages out of over 4,000. And it appears, and I wrote something, I think it's posted online somewhere. It's called uh, The FBI Can Go Fuck Itself. Yeah, that's on your website. It, okay, cool. And that gets into the FBI file. It, it's pretty clear that they immediately jumped from the shenanigans at the prison to Sean Swain, anarchist, Ben Turk, doing his support. What are anarchists in the free world doing? Because, you know, they immediately went into investigation of Redbird prison abolition, Ben Turk, you know, because they were more interested and just having a kind of open door to get into investigating anarchists. So that's why I think they probably did this frame up that's so obviously a frame up, you know. Mm -hmm. How did that case resolve? How did you get out of the torture cell, the black site? Well, it, you know, we spent a year in the special manglement unit at Mansfield. And then um, I guess they just got tired before we did. And, you know, after a year of torture, they just sent me off to the Supermax with Blackjack came here and a guy named Les Dillon. And, and, and so from that point forward, I guess they just, uh, they just had uh, devoted themselves to a campaign of slow roasted torment of me, um, specifically of me. Uh, so yeah, that's how that kind of, uh, that's how that went. I came here to the, to the Supermax. And uh, that's when you and I were talking, and uh, and I started doing the radio show. Yeah, and within a month of um, of our of your first segment, uh, I think it was the nineteenth of January. Um, within a month of that, you announced your run for governor of Ohio, right? Uh -huh. I don't know if you want to talk a little <laughs> bit about that and how that went. Yeah, I've never conceded that election. By the way, I've never mm -hmm. conceded. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, uh, Ohio's not legally a state, by the way. Ohio, according to the Treaty of Greenville, was set aside as, quote, unceded Indian territory, unquote. So there are 13 tribal entities that still legally own Ohio. And I ran for governor on the promise of abolishing the state and, uh, and returning it to its proper owners. And, um, you know... Nobody, uh, nobody ever announced my vote totals. So, I think, uh, I think at that point, I announced myself governor in exile. Um, and it was shortly after that that they shut down my communications for the first time, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> yeah. And for anyone who wants to wants to get a hold of that, the content of that argument about Ohio. Um, you can find a book that LBC published with the subtitle The Truth Behind Bob's Lane uh, or the essays themselves full and unexpurgated. Is that the correct term uh, are sure. available online? Yeah. Um, and with Ohio, uh, I, I hate pitching my own stuff like this, but with Ohio that, that LBC came out with, there's a part four that talks about how we can tear uh, topple the entire system. So th that's my vision of toppling the entire system is part four that you don't find online. So that's mm. the bonus. Yeah. Nice. That's just in the printed version. Yeah. And most of it's okay. in there. 
they had to they had to consult their attorneys to find out what they weren't allowed to put in there um, that could get them arrested. Yeah. So you know, only the stuff America that's landed in there the free. won't get them arrested. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Of yeah. course. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Let's see. So, uh, all right. So you had said at the end of describing the time at Mansfield, this is when you were put on um, communications blackout. Was after mm-hmm. this? Yeah. Do you want to? When I okay. came to uh, when I came to the uh, when I came to the Super Duper Max, it wasn't enough that I was just at the Super Duper Max. They had to suspend my email, suspend my phone privilege, and uh, I had an attorney at the time, and uh, there was already a lawsuit filed, and um, so th- th- this became the, 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 the there would be a, like an ongoing pattern each time. I said something that made them uncomfortable or made them look bad, they would simply black site me in place. Um, you know, shut down all of my communications and just leave me right where I was. Um, this happened when I, when I left, uh, when I left here, I went to Lucasville and from Lucasville, I went to Warren. Oh, by the way, when I was at Lucasville, uh, the guy who is second in charge of the entire prison system came to talk to me about uh, about blast blog, and um, what was that? That I well, a blast blog. I, I had written a proposal while I was being tortured, and I sent it out to like a million people, talking about um, something like the uh, I think Shack Seven. They had the Stop Huntington Animal Cruelty Group had doxxed corporate officers and put their home addresses online. So this wasn't a, this wasn't an original idea, but I had I had proposed a site that would be similar, you know, because the Ohio Department of Retribution and Corruption engages in torture, which is an international crime, and so the people who are involved in that should have their home addresses posted, and uh, somebody actually did that. <laughs> yeah, I keep saying stuff. I don't expect people to actually do it, but they actually mm-hmm. did that. And so I was at uh, I was at, at Lucasville, and a guy named Ed Voorhees came to talk to me. Ed Voorhees is a is a fuck weasel from way back, and he insisted that I was in charge and that my minions had done this. And see, every time they talk, it tells me they don't know anything about what being an anarchist is because they imagine that I'm a leader of some cult, you know. And uh, he insisted that I get that stuff taken down or else they would consider it a threat and they would make my life a living hell. And they did. Mm. They did. Yeah, I think their political education, like, ended at the Adam West Batman TV show, I think. Yeah, yeah. The Joker. Yeah. yeah. All villains are the Joker. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I ended up going from Lucasville to Warren – which was getting my security dropped when I when I posted uh, something about a Klan lynch fest and crab cake bake off that was going on at Lucasville. <laughs> and the, <laughs> the staff there hated me, and so the warden had me uh, emergency transferred a month early to lower security just to get me the hell out of his prison mm. before his staff killed me. Um, yeah. And I went to Warren where my communications were shut down again. So yeah. The company that was handling your communication, at least the email mm-hmm. stuff, was the company that you had written an essay criticizing in part because they the, their privatization scheme in coordination with the prison system of communications um, not only cost people's family a bunch of money, but didn't like some of your family's personal information get taken by them for communicating mm-hmm. with you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this was... Uh, Gary Moore was the director of the ODRC at the time, and uh, in something I wrote, I described how he had engaged in tens of thousands of counts of identity theft because all of all of our approved visitors, you know, prisoners, all of our approved visitors have to file these applications. Well, all of that paperwork was handed over to JPay so that they could handle money transactions from approved visitors. And none of these people approved of the ODRC handing over that information to a private company. 
so all of it was absolutely illegal from the very beginning, you know, all of this, this corporate outsourcing. And so JPay hated my guts, and the ODRC hated my guts, and it turns out also the FBI hated my guts because we didn't know it at the time. But JPay was a kind of information gathering metadata source for the FBI because they can monitor uh, transactions in real time and then create hubs of, inf- of, of investigation surrounding the people who are sending money to and from prisoners. And I didn't know that at the time, but that's why the FBI also hated me. So, you know, this is this is kind of like a whole collection of fart goblins and fuck weasels who just uh, who just wanted to crush me. So every time they would shut down my communications, I'm sure JPay and Global Telllink were more than happy to just pull the switch on me because I had I had already kind of peed in their cornflakes, and they did it quite frequently. You know, I was at I was at Warren. They shut off my communications for 14 months. I couldn't even talk to my mom or my dad. You know, I couldn't talk to Assam at the time. There were, there were people who, this is inflicting a kind of psychological pain, not just on me, but on the people who love me. Um, and I even went on, I think we talked about this in one of my segments. I talked about this. I went on a 50 day hunger strike in order to get my my communications restored. This was at Warren, you know. And um, they would continually target me when, you know, sometimes they would would use their discipline. You have one minute remaining. I hate Uh, Mm -hmm, uh, RoboKaren. Sometimes they would use their disciplinary process to justify shutting down my communication. Sometimes they would just flip a switch just because they were mad at me. Um, and so I went on a 50 day hunger strike to get my communications restored. And less than a year later, they shut my communications down again. <laughs> so yeah, the efficacy of hunger strikes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, you want to give a call back? I'll, yeah. I'll just, I'll just hang up now and call right back. Okay. Talk to you in a second. Just a quick content warning, the following discussion covers topics of medical neglect and possible suicide, so you can skip three and a half minutes ahead to 21 minutes and 40 seconds if you don't want to handle this right now. You had mentioned Isan. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about Isan. Yeah. So when I was was in SEG at Mansfield in the special manglement unit being tortured, uh, I started getting mail from... Assam from Houston and Assam loved cats and, and saw some story that had been posted about my cat Spike when I was a kid. And so she started writing to me and we, we took up a correspondence and then Assam uh, got on my visiting list surreptitiously. This is <laughs> contacted my case manager to get on there and then drove all the way from Houston to come see me. And, wow. and when I asked her why she had done that, um, she said that she wanted to come see me, but she was afraid that, that I would make her leave. And so this way, uh, she would at least get to see me for a minute. And I was like, oh, and so, you know, we really hit it off. And she had uh, she had scheduled to come back to see me again and had in Texas, they have a very loosey goosey laws about how they can involuntarily commit someone and someone for their own uh, interests had gotten Assan committed and uh, Assan rebelled against that and uh, she ended up suffering medical neglect they had they had uh, kept dumping lithium into her which is a salt derivative. So she was dehydrating and she wasn't eating or drinking. And they ended up sticking her, uh, she wasn't that old, but they stuck her on a geriatric ward in a diaper over in a corner uh, next to a, a, a radiator. And she had burns on her arm from the radiator and suffered medical neglect. Uh, her kidneys shut down and she died. They had to revive her. She ended up suing Ocean's Behavioral Hospital, 
I think I can say their name. She sued Ocean's Behavioral Hospital behind this and got like a few million dollars, but she had she had suffered brain damage from all of this and she had her own struggles and this really impacted her quality of life. And then later on, I'm kind of getting ahead of things, but I got transferred to Virginia and um, she was uh, she was really going through some real crisis and uh, ended up getting hospitalized again. And we lost touch for a moment and they shut down my communications and I had no way of, of getting a hold of her. And um, yeah. uh, the next thing I, I found out is that she had died. She had overdosed on a prescription medication. And I still don't know, you know, the reasons for this or, or what had happened because my communications had been shut down, you know, for several months on orders of, you know, the fart goblin high command. And so, yeah, uh, and I missed her, you know. Yeah. Um, she didn't deserve that. And so I know that, you know, all of these things that they do, you know, the black sighting in place, all of the nonsense, it doesn't just hurt me. You know, I'm pretty impervious, you know, uh, uh, I'm pretty resilient, but it, it hurts, it hurts real people out there in the world, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I can't help but wonder what role all of that played in, um, and what happened with Assam. Yeah. Yeah, it's like a, there's a story right there about institutions at various levels and in various places all kind of making decisions about what's best for people and shoving them into the boxes that they want them to be in. Um, yeah. 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 So, yeah. And I miss her. Um, you know, she was... Um, you know, it, it, we all have our struggles, you know, and, and hers were compounded by what had happened to her. But she was still, um, you know, uh, 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 there was some childlike wonder in the way that, that she viewed the world. And it was very refreshing. And, um, yeah. Yeah. I didn't I didn't know her all that well. Like we we chatted a few times on the phone and sent emails back and forth, like mostly where you were the main character. Um yeah. just like checking in, like, have you heard from Sean? Like, uh, what's going on? But um but yeah, she seemed like a really lovely person and and like deeply felt things. Uh yeah. Yes. That is she did. Yes. No, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah. So let's see. I was at Warren, and I went through a series of having my communication shut down, and they started blocking my legal mail on the grounds that this is what uh, ODRC counsel Trevor Clark presented as the theory behind blocking all of my legal mail was that they were investigating they were investigating court officials to see if they were part of my gang mm -hmm. because they were sending mail to me as the uh, authorized agent of the Army of the Twelve Monkeys. So a little bit of context here. What I had done when, when they told me they would never let me out of the Twelve Monkeys, I, uh, I actually uh, filed incorporation papers. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I own... I own the Army of the Twelve Monkeys, and it's registered as an animal enterprise. So if they try to interfere with the with the Army of the Twelve Monkeys, they are engaged in a federal crime with a 20-year terrorism spec. Thank you, Green Scare. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they <laughs> so so they were pissed off when they found out I had filed this paperwork and that I registered the trademark and that they could no longer register the Army of the Twelve Monkeys in the Department of Justice database and still get their block grant funding, you know, because, because they can't use that name to get money. Mm -hmm. So they started blocking all of my litigation on the grounds that they thought the judge was in my gang. 
because he was sending mail to the leader of the Army of the Twelve Monkeys. So uh, it was shortly after I, I had filed a lawsuit against Trevor Clark and against uh, SPG uh, um, coordinator at Warren, a guy named Kevin Chamberlain, that uh, Clark and Chamberlain got in cahoots and tossed me in the hole and blamed me for postings online and sent me back to the Super Duper Max. And I was only here maybe a couple of months, and uh, that's when they, <laughs> that's when they came at four o'clock in the morning, and uh, tossed me in a van and sent me to Virginia, the capital of the Confederacy. <laughs> so we just yeah. So right now, just to give a timeline, what like we were talking about stuff around the Twelve Monkeys that was starting up in 2011. Our segment started in 2014. Uh, you got bundled up in 2012. 2012, yeah, 2012, excuse me. Yeah. And then you got bundled up and shipped out from OD, or from OSP when? Uh, that would have been 2019, April of 2019. So I was in Warren for a few years, uh, yeah. having my communication shut down, turned back on, hunger, you know, hunger strike, get my communications turned back on. Then shut down again, another hunger strike. So you stopped p- taking heart medication at one point during it too for blood pressure, right? Yeah, yeah, blood pressure medication. Yeah, that's when they tossed me in the dungeon here at OSP in order for me, you know, which was, you know, they're not allowed to do that if you if you refuse. The, you know, they were trying to interfere with, with medical decisions because they didn't like the fact that I was using that medical decision to try to get my communications turned back on. That pissed them off. So, yeah. And then in here too, in relation to your prior, what we call like black sighting or what you've called black sighting, Mm -hmm. you filed uh, an international, well, do you want to talk about the, the case that you filed or the claim, the complaint that you filed and where? Sure, yeah. So this would have been back uh, during the year of torture is when I actually got started with that. I had filed a claim in the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, which is part of the Organization of American States. It's kind of like a, a sister organization to the UN. And um, I made claims of torture initially. And then I, I later added in claims that Ohio is not even a state that it's a violation of international law for the United States to claim ownership of this area called Ohio. And, uh, you know, we fast forward, I get to Warren, and I'm not receiving any mail for the Organization of American States or the uh, IACHR. And I get all the way to Virginia in 2019, and they wrote me a really, they wrote me a nasty gram essentially saying, if you're not going to litigate this case, we're just going to close it. And I wrote them back and said, look, I haven't heard from you since, you know, 2013. I don't know what you're talking about. And they sent me a whole a whole boatload of, of documentation that they had been sending to me that, that Ohio had been concealing from me because it appears they knew I was an international court challenging the legitimacy of their state. And they, they didn't want me to be able to be successful. So once I heard back from the international court and I started litigating again, uh, I got a decision from them. And this, is, this, this made history, actually, and nobody ever talked about this. But uh, this is the first time that claims of torture against the United States were filed in the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, and I got past the initial dismissal stage and and got to what is essentially the trial stage with that. And, uh, and the court said that, you know, these claims have merit. And so that happened around 2019, 2020, while I was still in Virginia. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there's got to be some, there's got to be a law against that about some state blocking a human rights commission from being able to communicate with someone trying to file a that's like an ultimate bullying action right there like Yeah. Yeah. Well, the other thing about it is they're so sneaky because it's not even like they give you official paperwork letting you know what they've done because they're cowards. Yeah. 
You yeah. know, they do all this sneaky behind the, you know, everything that they do, they never actually tell you the truth as to why they're doing what they're doing to anyone, you know, yep. you know, because, because, you know, all bullies are cowards mm-hmm. it, it is, is, is what it comes down to. That's spelled a cab the so, wrong way though. All cowards all, are bullies. All, 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 oh yeah. Okay. A back. Thank you for using GTL. Hi. Hi. How'd you get in here? <laughs> All the standard way. Pressing <laughs> buttons. Yeah. I mm-hmm. forgot to mention something. Yeah. Before I went to Virginia, they had attempted to send me back to Lucasville from Warren, and I had been contacted like a month before that from somebody in Lucasville whose legal work I had done. And he said, be careful because they're planning on sending you here because the guards are going to take you to J3 and uh, there's no cameras back there and they're going to hang you from a bed sheet and say you killed yourself. And I ignored what he had to say. I ignored the letter. I was like, oh, come on. These people can't be that incompetent. And then um, a month later, I came up on the on the transfer sheet to go to Lucasville. Um, <laughs> and so, And so... I had to give that some credence, and I'm lucky that I have people out there in the free world who who uh, who went to bat for me and exposed all this. Otherwise, I would have been hanging from a bed sheet. So, and and that was right before that that director of the ODRC, Gary Moore, was resigning, and this would have been like one of his last acts in office. Would have been a final dig that he would have gotten in. Mm. Um, you know, killing his, his, uh, his greatest pain in the ass. So instead they sent me to OSP and a couple months later, they stuck me in a van, uh, to Virginia. And I was in medium security in Virginia. I was wearing, yeah. uh, Levi's and, you know, my own, my own clothing, my own boots, hanging out, you know, watching Game of Thrones on the in-house, uh, TV channel. You know, spending all day out in the yard, getting a good tan. They had nice pizza on Wednesdays. Um, <laughs> well, we're we're kind of we are we are missing some stuff too in there. Uh, just to, uh-huh. I, um, for instance, in 2015, artists using songs that you had written had released an album called "Burning Down" that's still available on Bandcamp.com, right? Oh yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Luke Romano from Ramshackle Glory got that together. And there's a whole bunch of really cool bands that used my lyrics to music that they had created and put that out there. Yeah. 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 That's really good stuff. Yeah. Not that, not that, not because I was involved, but it's good stuff even <laughs> though I was involved. Yeah. I mean, the collaboration right there is something that I think is really cool. Just the fact that you've got, I'm pretty sure like, I don't know that I will say that, that folk punk is not my cup of tea, but mm-hmm. There are like recognizable bands. I mean, Ghost Mice I've seen a few times. Moon Bandits, like this is just naming a few as I go down. Cottontail, You People, Immaculate Misconception. There's some like, there's some recognizable bands on here, which I think is pretty great. Oh, and cool. the the music is good. I think they did a really good job yeah. of collaborating with you. Yeah, there I'm is that. that's really cool. Yeah, and it's still up for people to listen to. There's also back in. I see a post on here from 2015 where you in June where you were thinking that you were going to be interstate transferred. Uh, do you recall mm-hmm. that? Like after thinking a bit more about the planned security level reduction, Sean now suspects the ODRC is fixing to send him out of state. They blocked your video visits in January, went on hunger strike. I don't know if that was based on just like a what else could they do to me thinking like this is what they could do to me or or if that was based on other other material that could that yeah. led you to believe that that was going to happen. Well, th- this is this is kind of the pattern of what they do. You know, they'll have security reviews once a year, and mine typically occur at the end of summer sometime. And you know, if you go two years without any kind of disciplinary action, they're going to drop you to the next level. So I was going to drop down to medium security, and I would have access to programs that would get me eligible for a parole. And so every single time I would get that close, they would fabricate something in order to toss me in the hole. You know, Trevor Clark, the ODRC counsel at the time, 
would pull a chicken little and run in circles talking about the sky is falling and Swain is, Swain is bringing the world down around our ears again. And, um, and this time it was the drones article uh, mm. that was posted online that they attributed to me, even though my name wasn't even attached to it. And even though my communications had been shut down for six months. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I was black sided in place when this thing came out. They just decided I wrote it, tossed me in the hole, it's featured in Opposing Torture now, mm-hmm. also released from Little Black Carter. Since they attributed it to me, I'll just take ownership of it. So that article was also uh, uh, compiled in Opposing Torture. But it was at that time that uh, DJ Norris from Central Office, he's the STG head, security threat group uh, coordinator at Central Office, he said that, and I, but keep in mind, I hadn't even been charged with a rule violation of any kind in two years. I was about to go up for a security review and get dropped to medium. And he came to me and said, you know, we're sick of your shit. We're going to send you out of state. Mm-hmm. And I kind of laughed it off because you can't, you can't send me out of state just because you don't like me. Um, I haven't done anything. I haven't even been accused of doing anything. And so what developed after that was the disciplinary pretext for justifying the thing that they wanted to do. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. they, they, they decide they want to kick me in the head. And then after they've already set in motion the kicking in the head, they will come up with the excuse for why they kicked me in the head. Look, so, he made me do it. Why are you making me kick yeah. you in the head? Yeah, it's it's kind of like the same mentality as a domestic abuser. You know, I'm slapping you around because you burned the tuna noodle casserole, even though there's nothing wrong with the tuna noodle casserole. So that's the mentality of people who run prisons. So, yeah. uh, so that's when they that's when they sent me to Virginia, like in the middle of the night, no paperwork, no anything. And in fact, it's funny because. There is an official named Tracy Reveal, who used to be on the parole board, fun fact. And uh, Tracy has emails that she has sent out talking about the event of my transfer to Virginia. And even though they keep telling everyone that this was an interstate compact, uh, she admits in her emails that this was an illegal rendition using those words. So mm-hmm. the ODRC itself their own officials refer to this as an illegal rendition. They know what they did. You know, they didn't do any paperwork. They just, they just pawned me off on another state. Mm -hmm. Where, by the way, mm -hmm. where I wore Levi's and my own boots and my own shirts and And hung out and went outside and got a suntan and ate good pizza. Yeah. And the state of Virginia is still standing somehow. (laughs) So you keep, you keep skipping ahead in the... Uh, so why are you trying to hide your 2016 presidential bid? What do you have to hide? Oh, yeah. Well, you keep skipping past it. And then, uh, and then once I got to Virginia, 2020. Yeah, 2016, uh, I ran for, uh, for president and said uh, my campaign slogan, I think, was abolish everything, which is what I'm running on in 2024, if I mm-hmm. run. And I think if I'm you. running. People are pressuring you. Yeah. Yes. Yes, of course. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. So, um, yeah, so we had, uh, we had T-shirts and bumper stickers, and, uh, and I had a campaign pledge to abolish the, uh, the entire United States, which, you know, legally, uh, you know, this is, this, is, this is colonized land. So uh, just as in 2024, I have a a strict policy that no other presidential uh, uh, candidate has ever um, has ever endorsed a strict policy of, of battling illegal immigration. And uh, I'm doing it going all the way back to 1492. So mm-hmm. if I'm elected, we have to get the, we have to get a bunch of cruise ships and we have to find countries that are going to take, I don't know, 200 million crazy white people. And just sail them around and sail us around in the middle of the ocean. And yeah, I mean, mean, we'll find them a home. We'll find them a home. Yeah. You know, it's not, we have to decolonize. It's not the USA's problem anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. 
we have to give the uh, we have to give the land back to the people who actually own it. You know. Now, if you can work out some sort of deal with them and stick around, that's probably in your best interest. I can't guarantee how long they're going to keep feeding you on those cruise ships. <laughs> this was the initial plan behind the COVID outbreak. Was you remember? You remember that the cruise mm-hmm, ships. Mm-hmm. The cruise, cruise ships. ships. Uh, okay, so I'm I'm just give me one second. I'm just scanning back through mm-hmm. the website. And, and, and just to add mm-hmm. to that, just to add to that, um, you know, the founding fathers, as they're called, of the United States called this an experiment. Well, it failed. So it's time to stick a fork in it, turn it over, it's done. That's the scientific let's method. Let's just abolish this. Yeah, let's mm-hmm. just abolish it. Yeah, this is science. You're right. Uh, right. I'm just trying to see if there's anything else. I mean, there's a lot that happened in here, but... Mm-hmm. Kind of like okay. a comic book. <laughs> Hunger Strike 2017... Uh, bu- 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 skinny jeans, Ellie Weasel. Uh, Good book. A, a couple of years ago, the posts on the website started coming less, less often. Uh-huh. So whoever's doing that should get on. Yeah, I, I don't know who's running that anymore. I don't know, and I don't know that I have communication with them. Yeah, ChatGPT. So you ran for governor again in 2018. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So, I mean, since you were already governor, you were kind of a shoe in like, oftentimes when people are uh, running and already have the position, they've got a lot of a lot yeah. of institutional sway. Yeah, I was the incumbent governor in exile. Yeah. And then 2017, Little Black Heart uh, published a version of Last Act of the Circus Animals, right? Yes. Yeah, that was uh, that was when I began my uh, my publishing relationship with uh, with Little Black Cart was with uh, Last Act of the Circus Animals, which is awesome. And um, with Little Black Cart, like we've never actually had like a publishing contract, right? Mm-hmm. So they said, well, the, you know, our terms are usually this is how we work, and I'm like, well, whatever, you know, you know, give me what I got coming, and you know, that's what we'll do. <laughs> And so uh, we've, uh, you know, I think we, we both came to the conclusion that, that we, uh, you know, we didn't want to be in business with somebody that needed a contract to keep them honest. So we just, uh, I just kept writing and they just kept publishing. That's awesome. And, uh, and every once in a while there was a shoebox full of cash. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. just got handed, handed over to you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's... so. That's cool. That's how we roll. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. So we were saying, so there were, there were two other big events that happened. Well, well, let's talk about first, like when you and I had talked before about your plans for release, like oftentimes it was couched in, look, I just want to get out. My parents are elderly. They're like living in the Southwest I want to just go and mow their lawn and hang out with them and just keep my head down and live a life. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So another quick content warning, the following discussion covers topics of death of parents. So you could skip four minutes ahead to 48 minutes and 20 seconds into the conversation. If you don't want to handle that right now, um, you were in Virginia and the COVID pandemic had started and place like facilities were on lockdown um, uh-huh. I don't know if you want to like start, start the story there. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. So, um, yeah. So uh, yeah, yeah. Virginia was pretty hectic. We, uh, I got bumped around from a block to another block. Uh, they only had two deaths at the prison I was at, which is, which is yeah. pretty good, particularly given the amount of mismanagement that was happening. That only speaks to, uh, human resilience, you know, so it would be in, say, October or November of 2019, my dad went in for some heart tests. And the doc didn't like what, what, what he was seeing, scheduled my dad to see a specialist, and they said, well, you're going, to need, you're going to need bypass surgery. And from that point up until March of the following year, 
they just kind of put my parents on a spin cycle. And my mom had expressed frustration that once you get past a certain age, you become invisible. Nobody cares because you're not productive anymore. When my dad worked at Ford, when he was in his 30s and 40s, I mean, first he was a big guy, so he was kind of intimidating. But, 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 uh, but even a part, I mean, he could be intimidating. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but apart from that, you know, he was somebody because he's a producer. And so when he was in his 70s and he's needing a, a, a heart bypass and my mom is in her 70s, nobody's paying attention to them. So my dad went about five months before he finally got the bypass surgery. And by then, there had been so much damage to his heart. It was a few days after the surgery, he was still in the hospital. And I got called to some administrator's office. And uh, my mom had called. And they put my mom on a speakerphone with me uh, to tell me. Yeah, he didn't make it. Um, And so... My mom and I, you know, I went back to the block and just talked to her on the phone from the block. I didn't want an administrator sitting there listening to the conversation. And so from that point forward, my mom had uh, Alex and Jamie, who were two really great people, uh, helping helping her out. Because she couldn't have stayed, you know, in, in her home. She would have had to have been in some sort of assisted living without them. And my mom was was really grieving. You know, this is 2020. So, yeah, this, the, you know, they had been together for, I don't know, 55 years. Mm-hmm. And, and my mom would tell me that she didn't know who to be anymore. You know, part of her identity had always been that she was, yeah. you know, Paul's wife. She was Sean's mom. And she had always defined herself in relation to other people. And, and those, de- those definitional roles were gone for her. And that was really difficult for her. Yeah. My dad was a really incredible guy, too. Really incredible guy. And, um, you know, my parents deserved to see me come home. You know, I'm their only child. Yeah. And um, they deserved to see me come home. You know, they had always lived... You know, my dad worked at Ford. They had always paid their taxes. You know, they're the folks that will stop at a stoplight even when there's no traffic and there's no cops around. You know, yeah, always, always do the right thing. You know, always be honest in your affairs with other people. And they held their breath. You know, my dad held his breath until 2020, waiting for me to get home. And, um, you know... We lost him. Yeah. Yeah. Another, like another example, like you pointed to with Isan of, of the, like, I hope that listeners that are listening to this, like do understand that it's like, it's hard for you to lose loved ones. But as you've been pointing out, like also it's not like you don't, it's not like the relationships don't go both ways. It's not like, your friends and supporters aren't worried when you're on hunger strike or on medical strike or, you know, aren't grieving the fact that they can't share space with you um, when they want to and see you be as free as you want to be. Yeah. And and the other component to that is, you know, I, I think it's a valid question. Would they have ignored me the way they ignored my parents? If I was pushing for my dad to get his bypass surgery bumped up, you know, if I had stayed on the doctors, would they have ignored me? You know, if if I had been there to advocate for Assam, yeah, would, would they would they have recommitted her? You know, and and so these are these are people who are you know, um, it, 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 and I, I don't know what the answers to to those questions are, but I think they're valid. You know, yeah. would those would, would my dad and would Hassan still be alive today if I hadn't remained, you know, cap, captive all of this time yeah. after I could have been released? I don't know. Yeah. Which, like, yeah, begs the question of, like, again, like the role of prison in society, like, or the the implications of prison in society, like where all these 
all these families and communities that are broken up by Mm -hmm. people in positions of petty power who need to impose it on other people. That's a lot of peas, but like, yeah, yeah, what are like, really, was this worth it? Was, you know, because you were drawing angry cartoons (laughs) that were funny (laughs) and calling people fuck weasels. Like, is this, yeah really a realistic reaction this is what this is what our money goes to is to slowly kill people and break apart families it's great yeah Uh god bless america and then even and then you know just as a just as a side note to that you know later that year um 2020 i saw the parole board you know from virginia and you know they essentially told me that you know one of the reasons they gave for continuing me for five more years was that they didn't like my campaign slogan when I ran for governor, that they interpreted my campaign slogan to be a threat against the life of the governor. And, you know, they're the only people who interpreted my campaign slogan that way. I think it's a really yeah. irrational, you know, what, essentially what they're saying is we don't like you. We don't like what you say. We don't like what you write. We don't like what you stand for. And since we're right-wing extremists and, and we don't appreciate your sense of humor, we're going to give you five more years in prison, you know. So that's what stopped me from getting out in, in August of 2020 is that, you know, the people in power are, are, are again, too many Ps. The people in power <laughs> are pretty petty, you yeah. know. They really are. Um, so after this, was it August of 2021? Is that when you, no. When did you get married? <laughs> I feel bad I was uh, there. Yeah, that was, that was, uh, that was 2020, September of 2020. Okay. Okay. Um, so this would have been, <laughs> and I started corresponding in the summer of 2020. <laughs> was from Canada and was into roller derby and getting a women and gender studies master's, working on a master's degree. And, um, yeah, I thought the sun rose and set. Um, and um, so just a couple months after after we met, we decided we were going to get married. Uh, moved to Ohio for me to have a place to parole to and then uh, traveled all the way to Virginia for us to get married and uh, yeah we got married in let's see September of 2020 we got married and Mm -hmm. yeah I misspoke before Uh, I saw the parole board like three weeks later Mm -hmm. and the parole board continued me for five years yeah so that was uh that was my 2020 and i mean it was just heartbreaking to have to tell you know over the phone that uh yeah i was going to be locked up for five more years you know at least ostensibly we have an attorney to to deal with that but um yeah. but as of right now yeah can you talk about the process of getting transferred back and what that looked like for you and and what you learned later? Yeah. So after two and a half years of being in Virginia and wearing my own clothes and getting an ice suntan, uh, they came and abruptly got me early in the morning and told me to pack my stuff. And they, uh, they, they stuck me in a van and sent me to the reception center and told me I was going back to Ohio. They were exchanging me back for Kevin Rashid Johnson who was being sent back to Virginia. And ostensibly, I was told that Rashid had had created Prison Watch Ohio and had pissed off Ohio, so Ohio was sending him back. So in a tit for tat, they were sending me back to Virginia. But what I, but what I later learned was that it was because I had filed a federal lawsuit against Virginia, I'd filed a habeas, and their attorney general had looked over all of the paperwork for that and had said, you know what? Everything that happened here is illegal. Get that guy in a van and get him out of our state right now. <laughs> and so, and so, so your whole rendition. Yeah. Yeah. So 
I think everybody's in agreement, you know, from Ohio prison officials in their own internal communications, not what they're telling the rest of the world, and and what uh, Virginia officials said, and what I've been saying all along, everyone's in full agreement that what they did to me was absolutely illegal. Not that it matters, because it's just me. But, yeah. <laughs> Gotta love it. You've shared this before, but uh, but so just a little context because I I really appreciate Kevin Rashid Johnson. Rashid was the um, minister of defense for the New African Black Panther Party, uh, which is like a, a Maoist organization specifically uh-huh. for the um, prison chapter, and yeah. that's inside and outside. Rashid has since left in 2020, I think, left the NABPP and formulated with some other comrades who went along with him the Revolutionary Intercommunal Black Panther Party, which is, again, dedicated to destroying capitalism, patriarchy, and white supremacy. Yes. And uh, has written two books, which listeners can can find pretty easily, um, Defying the Tombs and... Panther Vision, that are, I think, both available through Kersplebedeb. And can you talk about the dinner party that you had with with, uh, Mr. Johnson? Yeah. Um, So I had been at the reception area in a specific block that's, like, segregated away. It's not segregation, but it was segregated away from the rest of the population there. And um, I had been there for a day or so when um, Kyle Rausch came He's the interstate, interstate compact guy. And for a guy who works for the fuck weasel, he's actually a pretty decent dude. So he was talking to me and he said, you know, sorry to see you leaving. You know, we enjoyed having you. And he said, have you met, uh, have you met Rashid yet? And I said, who? And he's like, come with me. And uh, there was a guy who had just moved into the block, had just gotten transferred there. And uh, he walked over. And uh, Rashid, by the way, is is a big guy. He's like six foot two, six foot three. I'm like five mm. ten. So this big towering guy comes out the cell, and uh, and Kyle Roush points at me and he's like, "Tell him what your name is." I said, "Sean Swain." And and Rashid looked at me funny. He's like, "Tell him what your name is." He said, "Rashid Johnson." I'm like, "Oh wow." He's like, yeah, you two get to know each other. And he walked away, <laughs> you know? And so, uh, so the two of us sat down and, uh, had, you know, had a discussion uh, about our own experiences and whatever. And we had a chance to throw away dinner together, which was kind of nice. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, we kind of exchanged notes and some people to get in touch with and, and uh Yeah. It was a, it was a, it was a really nice time. And then uh, the following morning, I got, I got brought up here to Ohio. Turns out, by the way, I think people need to know this about, about Rashid. Uh, Ohio had hidden from him a medical diagnosis of prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. And so he returned to Virginia and found out sometime later, you know, because uh, even with me, like, my medical records just never traveled with me for whatever reason they're supposed to, but they never do. And so he didn't find out till much later that uh, he had been diagnosed with, uh, with prostate cancer, and he's struggling now. I'm sure through the magic of the interweb, people can, uh, can look up and, and, and find out where to get the latest updates with him. They have transferred him back to Red Onion State Prison, which is where they said they weren't going to send him, and they're denying him medical care, essentially. You know, this is this is a medical assassination is what they're doing to one of the most revolutionary black figures in prison. And they're doing it at, you know, from the capital of the Confederacy. So if nothing yeah. else, the optics, the optics look pretty bad on that. So yeah. um, maybe somebody needs to alert them. You know, there's a reason why those Confederate statues were knocked down. How about you? Yeah. How about you stop trying to kill Rashid? Black folks <laughs> in general. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I 
I got a chance to talk to Rashid in, I think, 2016 or 2017. Um, mm-hmm. If folks have, for the show, if folks want to listen to that. And his website is uh, rashidmod.com, which is for Minister of mm-hmm. Defense. And yeah, and he's also had a bunch of his legal paperwork stolen in the last couple of months and, and not returned back to him, all while he's like been back and forth about uh, whether or not they'll actually give him any treatment for his condition. Yeah. Um, um, with the Ohio, uh, the ODRC watch, as I think it was going to be called, or maybe is called, I'm not sure if it actually took root. If you've heard of IDOC watch in Indiana, this was a part of, you know, this is attributable to Rashid's uh, interstate compact getting sent there and helping to organize among other prisoners and folks on the outside. This is like part of his legacy. And he has a similar legacy in Florida, in Oregon. I think he was in Texas at one point. He's been transferred from state to state and he keeps getting targeted and he keeps like organizing yeah. because he's just that dude. And now he's finally like back in the state that put him in, in the first place. Yeah. And they're killing him. Yes. Yeah. This is what prison does. So they sent you back to Ohio. They, mm-hmm. despite the fact that you'd been at a medium, they sent you back to the super duper Uber mega ultra Maxi Max hyper, in Youngstown. Hyper Turbo. Hyper Turbo. Yes. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> For how many yeah. times I've listened to that, I can't believe I don't have it memorized and saying it in my sleep. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Well, the funny thing is, when I got yeah. back here, they gave me an intake review, not the yearly uh-huh. review. Keep in mind that when I was in Virginia, I was getting yearly reviews on Ohio security reviews. So my, my, uh, my case manager had to come to me to have me fill it out because he didn't know how, he didn't understand how to do it because yeah. it's from Ohio. So I had to walk him through the paperwork. And so Ohio had to have been approving me staying at that medium facility the whole time I was there. But strangely, as soon as I cross state lines and come back into Ohio, I become super max dangerous again. And so I come back here. They don't bring me back to reception. They bring me back to the to the, the the super duper max, and they give me an intake review. And according to that intake review, I'm supposed to be minimum security. Hmm. So that got uh, that got filled out and sent to central office. And central office said, "Oh hell no, keep him at the super max." <laughs> So, but then they didn't want to keep you at the Supermax, right? They wanted to ship right. you out again. Right. So they decided, oh, we, yeah, we're not, we're not even going to keep this guy in the state. We're going we're gonna to hold him at the Supermax until we can find somebody else to take him. And they, they uh, decided it was going to be Maryland. And in the meantime, you know, I already had an attorney who was suing the Ohio Adult Parole Authority for their shenanigans, you know, and the reasoning that they keep giving for continuing me five years at a time. And so he had already filed that lawsuit, and I got with him about this interstate transfer stuff. And he's like, well, you do realize the Ohio Constitution forbids that. You know, Article 1, Section 12 of the Ohio Constitution specifically says that that no prisoner convicted of a crime in Ohio will be sent out of state. And so he had filed a civil action to stop my transfer to Maryland. They got wind of this because they got served a copy of it. And so they expedited their process of getting me to Maryland. And they still didn't even do what the law required of them. They just skipped all that. And and uh, and the van showed up um, to get me to Maryland. Um, and I had COVID at the time. You know, according to CDC guidelines and everything else, they were intending to stick me in a van with three other staff and and go traipsing across several states with a guy in the van who who was who was uh, positive for COVID. Road trip. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Because because that's what we do. And and so and it was such a last minute thing. Everybody was so flustered. And they were coming around with, with food trays and everything else. And uh, and that's when I lost my finger. Yeah. Uh, dismemberment. And that happened right at the time that the van, and this is historic also, this has never happened. 
the van was already gassed up and was idling in the garage waiting for me when some idiot slammed the food slot and uh and I lost the digit of my uh of my pinky finger. I can no longer throw a spiral. Mm. My career my career as an NFL quarterback is over. This is another pending suit, right? The uh interstate transfer one was, yeah. I haven't yeah. sued over the pinky finger yet. Mm. Haven't sued over that. Still got until February to get with my lawyer about that and see what he wants to do. Because I mean I'm a I'm a registered paralegal, you know, I'm certified. And now I can't even get a job doing legal typing because everything I type is going to come out to one long paragraph. I can't reach the return button. <laughs> God, Sean. So, <laughs> so I think that has to impact my, my, my future uh, employability. So, yeah, that's my thinking. <laughs> <laughs> so you've been, you've been sitting pretty at the, at the OSP. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, you, do you want to talk about, well, I don't know if, do you want to talk about the divorce happening or just kind of skip over it? Yeah. And... Yeah. I mean, we can, yeah, I don't, I don't mind. So yeah. Well, and, and in terms of me staying at the supermax, it's because, uh, you know, they keep overriding the fact that I'm supposed to be at a minimum with the fact that I'm a member of the army of the 12 monkeys even though right now in the Ohio prison system, I'm the only member of the Army of the Twelve Monkeys. So I am a gang of one, teaching myself secret handshakes at night. So, and they're supposed to be taking that designation off of me, except DJ Norris, who I, the last time I spoke to him, I told him he was useless. Um, mm -hmm. DJ Norris is the ODRC's security threat group guy. Uh, he keeps promising to come down here and talk to me and then take me off of the Army of the Twelve Monkeys designation. And it's been two years and nobody's talked to me. So I think we know what's up. And that's why I'm still here at the Supermax is because they keep, you know, contriving, uh, you know, uh, the reason for overriding what my security is supposed to be irregularly. Mm -hmm. So yeah, with with we um uh, I moved to Ohio uh, in anticipation of me getting out, and I didn't get out clearly. And I was here at the Super Duper Max, and so my hope was we were gonna you know ride this out, and um, you know the attorney was working on it and whatever, um, and. Like a lot of uh, personal relationships do, things began to change with ours, and my experience was that <laughs> became a little more neglectful and abusive, and yeah, there was just uh, there were some violations of trust that were happening, and so uh, September two thousand twenty two. We spoke for the last time, and I uh, I filed for an annulment, and then shortly after that, um, contacted the prison and told them that I was being harassing and or threatening over the phone, even though I was no longer even on my phone list. I, I you know, I, I'm not simply saying that that I wasn't abusive. I'm not just saying that I wasn't. I'm saying that I couldn't have been abusive because I wasn't even on my phone list. I couldn't call any more than I could have dinner with the King of Denmark. And so now I'm involved in all kinds of drama trying to unravel all of that because that can impact my release possibilities. So I have an attorney who is now filing a defamation claim against me. And, and hopefully we're going to get we're going to get that nonsense taken out of my file so that it doesn't impact my parole. I don't like all of that. I don't like drama in my personal life, but that seems to be what I've got. And uh, and I still think, you know, not to take anything away from because, uh, you know, I think I I think is an amazing human being, 
I just think that there's there's a lot going on there, and it became very hurtful for me. And you know, I have to I have to protect myself from that. So yeah, I wish them yeah. the best. A uh, final content warning: the following discussion covers topics of the death of parents, so you can skip two minutes and fifteen seconds ahead to one hour and 12 minutes and 30 seconds if you don't want to handle that topic right now pretty soon after this you got some bad news about your mom i don't know if you want to talk about yeah. this yeah um and my mom really adored adored them and my mom was even like trying to help us plan for baby names and, and one of them, by the way, was Brooklyn. And I said, Mom, you know that Brooklyn is a borough in New York, and you've never even been to New York. Why would you want to name our kid Brooklyn? What, what do you <laughs> – no offense to anyone in Brooklyn. No offense. But I've never been there. Um, so when all this kind of unraveled with uh, – my mom was really devastated by this. And um, it was just shortly after that that my mom's health took a bad turn. My mom was hospitalized, like, right before Thanksgiving of last year and then hospitalized again in, like, no, it would have been even before. Was it even before Thanksgiving? I, I know she was hospitalized around Thanksgiving. I think she was hospitalized again in December. And then in January... She of had 2023. a pacemaker. Yeah, she had a uh, she had a pacemaker put in, and she was doing so much better, you know. And and again, because of Jamie and Alex, my mom could my mom could stay in her own home, and and be functional, and not have to be in assisted living. And about eight days after her birthday, her birthday was February 11th. She had uh, had friends over and family, and. Um, she had an episode sitting in her chair. Um, she started breathing funny and passed out. And, um, yeah, they, uh, they couldn't bring her back. Um, and so, yeah, I lost my mom. Um, and you know, because you met her, uh, mm -hmm. She was she was a really really amazing human being, man. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah, she was really. Hard. And I think I saw her at a time when she was pretty tired, and um, maybe before the the pacemaker. But she mm -hmm. was she was really funny. Like I could see where you got your sense of humor from. Although I I never really? got to meet okay. your father, Paul. It. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um and yeah just really sweet really caring like i could see you called uh during the visit and talked to us and like yeah just sh sharing space with her um mm -hmm. was a delight it wasn't too long of a visit but it was really it was yeah. really pleasant and and what a lot of people will 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 relate to me about my mom and i'm sure you can probably confirm this also whenever you were in the presence of my mom you felt like you were being seen you mm -hmm. felt like my mom was able to clear out anything else that was happening in the universe and just yeah. focus on you and that she understood you you know she was one of those people that if you ever had any whoever you were you know i was in high school and i would come home from wherever i had been and my mom would be sitting around on the floor with all of these girls I went to school with. And they would all be staring at me and they'd be crying or something, right? Because, because one of them had broken up with her boyfriend oh. or something. And they were having this crying session. And I'm like, what are you guys doing here? <laughs> and, and, and my mom would be like, this is, this is private. You, you can't know anything about this. I'd be like, okay, well, hold on. I got to, you know. And I'd get some stuff together. I had to go to my room because my mom was sitting around with all these girls I went to school with. And I'm like, what are, what are they even doing here? They don't live here. <laughs> <laughs> but, but my mom was that way for everybody, you know. Mm -hmm. She was that person. 
I, I don't even know how they knew my mom, but they did. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, and this was, this wasn't, this wasn't an irregular thing. You know, my mom was that kind of a person. So yeah, I miss her. This is my first Christmas, um, without being able to call her and hear her voice. And that's yeah. kind of hard. That's hard. But we can't leave it at that. We can't just leave it no. at my mom dying. That can't be the last thing. Oh, no, no. Yeah, I mean, I, if nothing else, I would, unless I'm skipping too far ahead, but I'd like to hear about like what your plans are and what your legal situation's like and um, what your hopes are, like next steps forward. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I've got uh, I've got some really great people in my corner, um, some really good friends, and it seems like that circle of friends keeps expanding over time, despite the best efforts of the fart goblins and the fuck weasels. And and one of those is a, a friend of mine, Adam, Adam Baum, who's been like central to my whole support work and all of that. He's he's a really great guy, and um, so my hope is. I've got uh, I've got counsel, uh, largely because Adam forked out a, you know a pile of money, and counsel is suing the parole board, suing the uh, chair of the ODRC, and uh, j- just a quick side note here before I forget, the the ODRC uh, has these little film shorts that they play at the movie theaters before you see a movie. And it's propaganda telling you how great the Ohio prison system is. And I'm here to tell you the whole thing is bullshit. If you ever see a movie in Ohio, don't believe anything they're telling you. Yeah. Uh, Adam told me about that, by the way. He saw a movie and he's like, he he just can't even stomach what they're saying. That's wacky. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Welcome to Germany, 1936. We uh, We have propaganda films before you get to watch the movie. So my attorney, Eric J. Allen, he's out of Columbus, is suing the parole board, and he's suing Annette Chambers Smith. And, uh, you know, we, we still have the possibility of uh, a lawsuit over one of the digits of my right hand. Don't know yet. And uh, we're hopeful because he's sued the parole board and won several times. And typically what they do at some point, they come and negotiate with you and they bring you back up to the parole board. As of right now, the parole board has been unresponsive. I've been granted 25 months of, of time credit that they hadn't given me at my last parole hearing. So mm. I really should be seeing the parole board in May or June of next year rather than in 2026. But they seem to be unresponsive and they don't want to give me the time credit just because I'm me and they're hateful. But uh, all things being being equal, I should go up uh, next spring. And uh, my attorney, I think probably because of the lawsuit we filed, the parole board has engaged in a series of reforms. And my hope is that uh, that they tell me, you know, Mr. Swain, we have some bad news for you. You can't stay here for free anymore. <laughs> And that means, uh, you know, I'm going to get out. Adam is having a house built right now. So uh, his intention is to simply let me move into the house he's living in now. And apart from that, I've got, I've got family in Iowa. And, and, and I've, got, uh, I've got friends in, in Michigan. So if the, if the parole board actually wants me to go out of state, I have places I can go other than Ohio. And, uh, you know, I've got enough to get by at least for a minute, you know, because of uh, what I inherited from my parents. You know, I've got I've got a little bit of money stashed to the side, um, you know, to get back on my feet when I get out there. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure what exactly what the future holds, but uh, but I'm sure that something will present itself. I think we're all responsible to some degree to find a way to make our lives have purpose and meaning. And so I think whatever scenario we find ourselves in, whether it's prison, whether it's out there on the other side of the fence, you know, wherever we are, I think there are ways that, that we can, that we can struggle to, uh, to, to find that purpose and meaning. And so, you know, when I get out, 
yeah, I, I don't think that'll be an issue for me. I think um, I think something in my life will present itself. I'm kind of an optimist that way. I'm a glass half full kind of guy. <laughs> yeah i I was hoping you could say a, a few things about like what are the grounds of your lawyer's challenge to the parole board? Just that they've been dealing with your case on a regular basis under false pretenses or what what's like the legal argument there? So I first came up for parole in 2005. So I served about 15 years to the parole board. And from that point forward, all of the time that I've done has been in increments because that's what the parole board has assigned to me. And the parole board, by the way, it creates its own rules. It's the only agent. It is the most powerful agency in the state of Ohio. It has absolutely nobody over the top of them telling them what they're allowed to do and not do. They pretty much write their own rules and they give themselves permission to break their own rules whenever they feel like it. But they still have to abide by the Constitution. Um, that's one of the few things they have to do. And what they have consistently done with me is, okay, so first, they will rely on disciplinary findings that were written by people like Trevor Clark, ODRC counsel, and railroaded me through the RIB process, the disciplinary process, where even the chair of the RIB will tell me, you know, my hands are tied on this. You know who wrote it. You know I'm going to find you guilty. And so they have no due process through their disciplinary action. There is no due process applied to this. You're not entitled to due process there. The U.S. Supreme Court has said so. So they're allowed to be a kangaroo court, and they're allowed to come to their own kangaroo conclusions, which they routinely do with me. Well, then I see the parole board, and the parole board, who has to provide me due process, looks at these kangaroo decisions and says, well, based on these kangaroo decisions, we're going to give you five more years. Well, first off, wait a minute. Um, you have to give me due process. And I don't understand how this can possibly be due process, you know, fundamental fairness, when you're relying upon decisions that didn't require fundamental fairness. <laughs> you know, so, so based upon what somebody said and stamped on a piece of paper, you're going to give me five more years. So that's the first thing. The other thing is, and, and uh, sometimes, like this last time to the parole board, uh, one of the parole board members specifically told me that, that they found what I had written in my campaign slogan to be a threat, even though I had never been charged with a threat. Nobody had ever accused me of a threat. He's the first person to think that my campaign slogan was a threat. And so right on the spot, they essentially charged me with misconduct, found me guilty, and gave me five more years in prison for what is provably protected speech in a public forum. You know, that wasn't even my speech. It was posted by somebody else. So this is something else that they do. You know, they just cherry pick. They go online and cherry pick things that are posted. They will attribute that to me, whether I wrote it or not, and I may have, you know, and then they'll simply say, well, we think that's a rule violation. We think that's a crime. And they'll just give me more time. Something else that they did um, that they're not doing anymore, there was a, 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 a checkbox on the, on the parole decision form that allowed them to give you more time because people in the free world objected to your release. You know, at one time they had this process set up where people could call the parole board hotline and tell the parole board what a jerk you are. And if there was enough popular sentiment that you're a jerk, they would check that checkbox and give you five more years in prison. So they've essentially done that to me. And this really is a, is a questionable process because first off, my release is determined upon winning a popularity contest in the, in, in the free world. 
you know, I have to win this congeniality to get out of prison. And second, I don't even know who's voting on who gets Miss Congeniality because nobody's telling me who it is that's calling in and trolling me. So there's no way for me to change their minds. So uh, part of what my attorney's doing in discovery, you know, he's saying, okay, well, the reason you gave, one of the reasons you gave is that there's popular support for keeping him locked up. Tell us who called in, show us the communication. And, uh, and let us call these people as witnesses to see if they actually called in or not. And since the parole board doesn't want to give that up, chances are they're going to, they're going to negotiate a settlement in this case. That's part of it. And, and, um, and what they've also done now, they've taken that checkbox off the forms. Mm-hmm. Not only have they taken that checkbox off the forms, but after my attorney filed the lawsuit against them, In a historic reform for the Ohio Parole Board, prisoners can now have their counsel sit in on parole uh, uh, hearings. They're not allowed to talk. They're not allowed to to interject in any way, but they're allowed to be present and take notes. And that's never been allowed before. So it appears as though they're kind of setting up where there is going to be some sort of check and balance to their power because they're going to be aware that somebody's looking over their shoulder for the first time ever. And that's because of what my attorney filed. So there's already changes that are happening. And with any luck, you know, I'll be seeing the parole board uh, within the next six months or so. And my attorney will be sitting in the room and they're not just going to know me as that guy whose politics we don't like. So let's crush him. They're going to know me as that guy who has who has forced them to clean up their act and let's send him home uh, yeah yeah let's get him out of here which you know my attorney in discussions with my attorney i'm sure he won't mind that I'm, i'm mentioning this you know he's even said he doesn't understand why they just haven't gotten rid of me if if somebody is that much of a problem for you as they say that i am why wouldn't they just give me a parole and get me out of their hair? He can't figure that out. And so it's not like it's you've been of, like getting charged with assaults running up and down the prison in the meantime. And like that yeah. you're posing an actual threat to personal safety or anything like that. These are all opinions yeah. and feelings about words that you're saying or that are being attributed yes. to you. Yes. And, you know, not to ruin my insurrectionary street cred here, but, Pound for pound, I might be the least dangerous prisoner in Ohio penal history. I've never been charged with a fight, with a single act of violence. There's nobody who would say I even gave them a paper cut. No drugs, no alcohol, no serious misconduct of any kind, no actual gang activity. You know, gangs don't write articles. So, you know... I'm not beating people up and taking their property and, you know, slinging dope and causing, causing havoc and mayhem. I'm, I'm, I'm actually pretty, pretty self-managing. So all of the things that they normally say they hate, I'm not. And all of the things they actually wish their prisoners would be, I'm all of that. It's just that when I'm that, they don't like it. <laughs> yeah, maybe the problem is that you're the model prisoner. And they want to keep you. Yeah, I'm just well, kidding. I mean, I'm not trying to start anything. <laughs> well, well, no, but, but you actually have a point there because there, there was internal paperwork from the parole board in a lawsuit about two and a half decades ago that they actually had a name. There was a, 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 a title they gave to prisoners who, who were, quote, unquote, stabilizers in the prison population. Mm-hmm. And so they kept them in prison longer because they were stabilizers. They they officially stopped doing that when they got caught doing it, but I'm sure they still do. Mm-hmm. But in this case, it's not even so much because of what I do. It's just because of who I am. And I think that's an important distinction in order to understand their behavior from start to finish, the whole trajectory of what they've done. It isn't what I'm doing. It's who I am. Because I could sit perfectly silent and they will still find a reason to hate me, you know, 
at least at this point. Um, even though Blast Blog has been taken down, mm -hmm. I got when I were still together, and got Blast Blog taken down. And right after Blast Blog got taken by talking down, to the I, hosts of the yes. of the web platform, not even because yeah. there was any way of communicating with whoever had put up the blog in the first place. Right. And so we explained to, to, to the to the people who were who were who were hosting it that this is being attributed to me and it's screwing up my chances of getting out of prison. Take that stuff down. And they actually took it down. And so right after that, they shut down all my communications again. So. <laughs> No good deed goes unpunished, you know. Mm -hmm. you, you you try to bend over backwards for the state, and, and you know, in order to to prove to them that you're you're being as nice as pie, and they kick you in the face for it. It's what they do. We have one minute left. You have one minute remaining. I wasn't going to put this out immediately anyway, so um, like, okay. yeah. If I think of anything, well, thanks for doing this. Oh yeah, thank you. Th thanks for ten years of, of recording segments, um, or sending them out, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's been awesome for me. You know, it's been life changing for me. Um, yeah, all the kicks in the heads are worth it. <laughs> so yeah, it's been nice to get to know you and be your friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah and uh, yeah, you're awesome. Oh, you're awesome. You're one of the top can... five coolest people in the world. Woo! Top five. Oh. Yeah. They can't hear me blushing on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> this is The Final Straw Radio. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at TFSR, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books. Located at 1022 Haywood Road in West Asheville, Firestorm Books is a worker-owned cooperative in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a catalog of Firestorm's books and zines, plus a full calendar of events at their website, firestorm.coop. You have one minute remaining. This is anarchist prisoner Sean Swain with the Final Straw Radio Show on the Channel Zero Network. Abby Hoffman once said, the ground you're standing on is liberated territory. Defend it. If he were still alive, he'd be binge listening to the Channel Zero Network, too. Channel Zero Network, because every countdown ends at zero. What you say, what you say, what you say, what? You know, it's only a matter of time before ski mask clad, machete wielding, Molotov throwing rebels take down the oppressor system. If you haven't been listening to the Channel Zero Network, you've given others a head start on all the fun. This is anarchist prisoner Sean Swain with the Final Straw Radio Show on the Channel Zero Network urging you to get a ski mask and binge listen to the Channel Zero Network. This is anarchist prisoner Sean Swain with the Final Straw Radio Show on the Channel Zero Network. Emma Goldman once said that our liberation lies in our emancipation from authority and from the belief in it. If she were alive today, she'd be binge listening to the Channel Zero Network too. The Channel Zero Network, because every countdown ends at zero. Here at the Channel Zero Network, we give no preferential treatment to liberals or conservatives. They all remain duct taped in the basement until their respective ransoms are paid in full. This is anarchist prisoner Sean Swain with the Final Straw Radio Show on the Channel Zero Network. Channel Zero Network, because every countdown ends at zero. This call is originating from an Ohio correctional facility and may be recorded and monitored. Channel Zero Network, because every countdown ends at zero. This is anarchist prisoner Sean Swain with the Final Straw Radio Show on the Channel Zero Network. 
calling in another bomb threat to remind you that every single countdown ends at zero. Channel Zero Network, take back the future in five, four, three, two, one. This is Anarchist Prisoner Sean Swain. And my participation in the Final Straw radio show on the Channel Zero Network has earned me 1,297 pages of FBI files. Channel Zero Network. The truth is dangerous. Wah, wah.